I'm Tobias, and this is Will. Uh, together we have a number of curious and exciting topics to share with you. As attendees of the Hand Eye Supply Curiosity Club, you are all now members, provided you adhere to our philosophy. Ex Curiositas Scientia. We pledge to learn without prejudice in pursuit of our mutual goal, perpetual novice. We admit that it is impossible to know everything about anything, and thus we remain perpetually curious and perpetually novice. This is our flag and our mascot, Franklin. The lightning bolt represents the receipt of knowledge, the enlightenment of illumination, the resonance of truths understood. It awakens us and excites us and makes us hungry for more. And now let's give a warm Curiosity Club welcome to Jack and Pugat. Hi, <laughs> I'm Jacqueline. Um, I make prints from alternative processes. Uh, they're technically called photographs, but as you can see, they don't really look like photographs that you would see normally. Um, in real life, I'm a graphic designer and I do this um, as my hobby. So today I'm gonna talk about two different processes mainly. Um, one is called cyanotype, which is one that most people have probably heard of. It's also called a sun print. Um, it's the blue toned process. I actually have a bunch of stuff to pass around today, so. I will pass this around. Um, <laughs> but basically, it's a blue tone process. You probably used it in middle school or high school, and you put you exposed like leaves and sticks to it. Um, so I use different negatives that aren't leaves and sticks, and they come out like this. It actually took a long time to figure out. So by mixing a bunch of chemicals together, they finally got that. Um, so cyanotype was one of the more popular forms because it's really easy to use. It's not very toxic um, compared to most other processes, which is nice. That's why you use it in like middle school or high school. Um, and you get a really nice tone range. Let's see, where am I? <laughs> um, yeah, so cyanotypes are made from potassium ferrocyanide and ferric ammonia cit citrate, um, which are it's basically just two chemicals, which is nice and easy to do. It's just one to one of each. And um, first you get your negative, which I have a couple here that I can pass around. Um, I do a very cheap method that is also done in screen printing, where you print out a laser copy of your negative and then you oil it up so that it's kind of transparent. So this is the cyanotype layer of this print right here, actually. I'll pass that around so you can see it. So after you have your negative, you coat your paper. So you mix the chemicals one to one, coat it in the dark, and then um, mixing the chemicals together makes it light sensitive. So then you can expose your negative to your paper using sunlight or UV light which here sunlight is like horrible, so you have to use UV pretty much. Um, and then you run it underwater until you get your print and it's that easy. So that is the layer one for most of my prints. Um, I do do just cyanotypes, which is this one with the triangles here is a cyanotype only. And um, actually it fades from the bottom to the top because of a mistake I made, so yay! <laughs> um, basically, the negative and the paper weren't sandwiched together enough, so uh, there was a kind of a space between where the light and the negative could connect, I guess. Um, basically, you put, like when you're exposing your negative, you put it into something like a picture frame so that it can be connected to each other, basically, and mushed so that the light can hit it. Um, and then you get pretty stuff. So the next layer that I do is called gum bite chromate. That's the more complicated one. Um, like I said, this is a process that isn't really used. I use stencils because I like it. Um, uh, you can use actual photographs too, but that becomes a lot more difficult. And so that's another reason why you don't see this process used a lot. Um, it's a colloid process, which means you're mixing a dichromate with an organic material, which in this case is gum, gum arabic, um, and then that makes the chemical light sensitive. Um, there is another process called casein printing that's pretty similar, but instead of using gum, you're using um, curds and whey. 
So you can do this very cheaply and use almost spoiled milk and you'll get the same pretty much image, which is pretty interesting. Uh, the guy who figured this out is pretty amazing in my opinion because that is some experimentation happening. <laughs> so in the way that they're not similar. <laughs> um, oh, my first gum, I also have this to show, which I could have shown sooner, but I didn't. Um, my first gum by chromate. So it's a difficult process, and there's a lot of mistakes to be made, and one of them is time. Like if you expose it too long or too short, I think this is too short, and I have the negatives here so you can kind of see what that was supposed to look like versus what it does look like. And this one I actually even printed the, ne the negative backwards, so it's really messed up, but I still kind of like it. I think it still <laughs> is fun. So that's why I really like printing this way. Um, so I mentioned before that people can print actual photographs with gum bichromate, and they do that by making a negative out of each color from the photograph, so you would split your photograph into layers of CMYK and then make a negative out of each one and then choose a watercolor to match the CM, the Y, or the K. And then you would print layers. So it can be done. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it in a nutshell. If you have any questions. Um, so with the, with the gun microphone, to get yeah, so um, when you're mixing the dichromate and the gum together, it makes something that is, when it's exposed to light, it, like the part that exposed gets hard and then the other part washes off. And that print is clear, like you wouldn't really be able to see anything. You might be able to feel it. So the way that you get a layer that you can see is by add, adding pigment. So some people do a powder pigment uh, you can do wet pigment, pigment like watercolor. You can use, you might be able to use acrylic, I'm not sure, but you can use pretty much almost any pigment, pigmented art product that you want, which makes it pretty flexible. <laughs> so with that, where is it that the ink is sitting in the space that's allowed from the negative? I'm trying to figure out how the ink lays the color in certain places. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> didn't explain that very well. Um, so let's see, this is the gum layer of this photo. So the black part is the part that doesn't get exposed and the white part is the part that does because the white part is technically clear. Um, and so you put it under UV light for, I think I do these for 10 minutes, and then um, you take the negative off and you can kind of see where it start, like it's starting to change colors. There's like a, visual difference and then you run it under water until this layer comes like this section of the photo comes off and then you end up with your image and then you can do as many layers as you want or whatever <laughs> so is it like an emulsion? sort of um, yeah kind of yeah that's what the chemical is basically doing um, but it the pigment's in there too, so you don't have to do anything afterwards. Like, that's it. <laughs> you just wash. Can you do this in the kitchen or I do this in a photo lab. Yeah. It's, gum bichromate is kind of toxic. It's like, but you could use, like, for your negative, you could use pictures of people. You could do, like, a picture of your dog or whatever, or you could do shapes like I do. So it's pretty... First of all. Do you have a, uh, it sounds like you really know your chemistry. Do you have any background in that? Or do you just take it <laughs> I'm glad it sounds like that because uh, I don't. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a degree in graphic design and photography. Nowhere in there did I learn any. I don't even think I've taken a chemistry class. I just kind of learn what I have to learn so I don't kill myself. <laughs> yeah. So, um, if, yeah. Maybe I wasn't listening. Maybe I was looking at pictures when you said this, but how do you make the negatives? So I make the negatives on my computer. I use Photoshop. Um, I'll design what I want to be printed, and I will separate the layers into two different layers. So 
Um, yeah, I don't use film or anything. One of, the proce or one of the reasons why this process kind of failed in the past is because they would have really thick negatives that they took pictures with, and the sunlight couldn't get through it, so their prints didn't come out very good. But nowadays, there's ways that you could easily, or more easily, print photographs. Any special paper for the negatives? So I just use copy paper from like Kinko's. You can print on transparencies, which are clear plastic, um, but I don't because I am cheap. <laughs> yeah. So you, um, one of them, you just mentioned that it was, it's difficult because of the, the negative, um, the thickness of the negative. What are, there, what are some of the other reasons that this is like a really challenging process? So it's super, super challenging if you're trying to print a photograph of someone because it's just like when you coat the paper, it really depends on, like a lot of people when they're printing really nice photographs, they want a nice even layer of paint, which is really difficult to do. And uh, that would make your photo look way more realistic. Um, and that's pretty hard to get. Um, a few other reasons that people didn't like it is just it's very, it's hard to, it's a fickle process. It's really difficult to get the same image over and over again. It's really difficult to get a good image. I pretty much only stick to doing two layers and I use cyanotype for the first layer because it's much easier process. Um, so really getting a tonal range is difficult to do in one layer and getting an even coat of paint is just like almost impossible. Like all of these pretty much look different because of my brush strokes and like I missed a bunch of spots like that orange boxy picture right there. The whole page was supposed to be orange and then I couldn't see because it was dark and so yeah. it didn't really coat all the way. The, one of the hard parts is you have to do everything in the dark pretty much until you expose the image to sunlight and then uh, you can kind of bring it out into the light. Yes? Um, in terms of using the, the UV light, like what is your window, like your time window, like of like, you know, this underdeveloped or overdeveloped? And so with gum by chromate, it depends on what color you're using. Some colors are more opaque than other colors which is kind of strange to me. I'm still wrapping my brain around that one. But um, yeah, it really depends. <laughs> if I did it on purpose, which I haven't done yet, but I'm planning on doing, I think that it could come out really good. But when I did it on accident, it kind of made everything a brown. Because I, I coated one, I was doing these posters, and so I coated one with yellow, and then I was coating, I forgot to switch brushes, and so I dipped my yellow brush into like, red or something and it sort of made like a brown color but you could see where the yellow and the other color were so i think if you did it like on purpose it would look good like you could do it but i have yet to um prove that statement <laughs> yeah so for applying it you, you just brush it I mean, are there any other, like, yeah sort of um i use a, I use a foam brush I have heard of people using paint rollers, which apparently gets a pretty even coat. Um, there's a lot of people that swear by Japanese brushes, like the bamboo brushes. Um, but I think foam works pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty much, I'm, I think the paint roller is probably a good one for people who are trying to get an even coat, but it still seems like it'd be risky. Mm -hmm. Have you found like other, like a, So that's a tricky question. They're very secretive. <laughs> They're like still eluding me at this point. There's like one forum on the internet about this and like everyone on there is like 80 and I think there's like three people. So <laughs> I found this book that's really awesome. It's called Gum Printing and Other Amazing Contact Processes. Um, this guy who wrote this, he did like years of research like trying to get the history down for different processes, which there's like, it's pretty spotty. And he references pretty much everyone that I've ever heard of that's like popular for doing the style, which is like four people. So I don't think there's a lot of people that do this. I think it's my people. 
Um, so I took a couple classes in college, but it was kind of a funny situation because my teacher at the time had just started working in this department doing alternative, they had one class on alternative photography. And he knew as much as you know when you do like the sun print where you expose the leaves. So <laughs> that was a, it was a learning experience. Um, I pretty much just played around with stuff until I figured it out and then I think he still goes off of what I told him to do. So I haven't, took, I haven't taken like a legit class, but I've heard that there are classes that you could take. But I think most focus on other alternative printing processes, like platinum and stuff like that. So it's a little bit hard to find. I, I uh, print at New Space right now, and every time I go in there, they're like, what are you doing? <laughs> they're like, we're scared. We don't get it. <laughs> so that's been my life. Can you talk a little bit about switching the two, between the two processes or what, the, what, what it's like from beginning to end of combining the cyanotype Yeah, the process? Um, so I always do the cyanotype process first. I don't think it would be a good idea to do it second, but you could probably if you wanted. Um, so I will go through the process and make the negative, expose the negative to the, the paper with the chemicals on it and then wash the print so it comes out with the cyanotype image. And then um, I basically do that same process again with gum by chrome and printed the yellow over it. Um, so that's usually the process. Like with this, I printed the blue and then the yellow, uh, blue and then green, blue and then orange. So the ones that are pairs like this, these are the same negative with the same time and the same colors and everything. And Shit happened, so now they look different. <laughs> um, and you can kind of tell, like, if you don't wash your prints long enough, like this one, I didn't really wash the orange away very well. Um, it kind of just stays on there and stains, which I think can be good in some cases. <laughs> yeah? Um, do you have to do the first, or can you switch up and do, like, a gum by gum? I don't think you have to do the cyanotype first. Um, so like I said, there's very few people who do gum bichromates. There's even fewer people that mix processes together. So um, there's not really a lot of examples of what that looks like. <laughs> I don't think I've, I've only seen one other person that mixes processes like this, and they also did the cyanotype first. I haven't experimented with it, but once you, when you first print the, the gum, it's really delicate and it comes off easy. So I have a feeling if you re-wet it, it might flake or something, but it also might just be permanent. It could be something to experiment with in the future. <laughs> yeah? Where do you find the chemicals? Um, pretty much the internet. <laughs> 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 the internet kind of has everything. <laughs> A lot of photo stores carry this stuff. Um, they, a lot of processes use kind of the same chemicals every now and then, so you can get things from photo stores usually, and then some of the other stuff, like I'll get off of Amazon. Um, yeah. So with the pieces that are in front of us, are these all just done for fine art prints, or some of them used as commercial work for you for graphic arts? What did you do with the pieces that you used? So, Pretty much it's a hobby for me, um, but I do have an Etsy shop that I sell prints in, and I have a website that kind of supports that. And um, in the past, I've sold prints to interior designers and people who want to decorate their homes and stuff, which I like doing. I could never see this being something that I did full time because it's very time consuming. Um, but it's fun to know that other people like things that I like. <laughs> so, yeah. Have you had like specific requests or has somebody been like, I want you to do this on this? So for instance, like I want you to make a picture of a sandwich on a sandwich board for me or something like that? Like, <laughs> no, I haven't gotten any custom requests yet. Um, but that's something that I kind of want to experiment with in the future, especially because I think it could be really interesting to have someone else's input. Um, I'm actually hosting an art show in October during Design Week Portland um, where I'm inviting a, f a bunch of different artists, actually, to design posters however they want to design it, and then I will print those posters and we'll show them in a show. So I actually have flyers to pass out for that. 
Um, I'm still doing a call for artists for people who would like to be involved. So if you or anyone you know would like to make a poster, um, there is a website where, or there is a link on there that you can go to to find out more. And also that is my website on there. So take one. Um, between layers, it can shrink and expand and then your layers will be really off. So it gets really complicated because the water that you use to wash off um, the excess ink. So I hope I explained everything tonight. I was a little nervous. <laughs> yeah, you definitely, like if possible, you always want to shrink whatever surface that you do this on. So it's kind of like when you, if anybody does watercolor, you always want to shrink the paper first and then like tape it down and like make sure it's all going to stay that size. Um, so this is kind of like that. Yeah, most of the time I do it visually, um, but I do sometimes use like registration marks and things like that. So ones where it's like kind of more important that it's registered. But you know, if I mess up and it's like off, I like that. So <laughs> I'm like, oh cool, it happened again. <laughs> Instead of like shit. <laughs> so yeah, um, I have a few things to give away. Um, those flyers that I handed out, I hope you took one because if you didn't, you might be sad. Um, on the back, some of them have a little stamp. So you could be the lucky winter winner. It just says HUDs real small, which is the name of, oh, lucky you. Cool, okay, well, I'll let you go first then since you were the first person to show me. So you have three things to choose from. You have this big one, which is kind of a tree pattern with raindrops. Um, you have this box that has a good example of brush strokes from putting on chemicals. And then there's this triangle, which got a bunch of salt stuck to it, so it made this <laughs> little pattern on there. <laughs> so you can go ahead and just pick which one. <laughs> yeah. All right, who else got one? All right, which one would you like? This one? And then I hope you really wanted this one, because. <laughs> OK, that's perfect. Yeah, and if you wanted to like look at this book or anything and find out more secrets, feel free. <laughs> That's my talk. All right. Um, next week, or next in two weeks, uh, we return on July 29th with uh, Kate Bingham and Burt, uh, illustrator and educator, with her talk, Eight Days a Week. And so the way that she wrote this, you kind of have to imagine that she's reading it, so do, do that. Kate will involve colorful visuals, excitement about personal projects, both hers and others, her path from wanting to be a morning TV personality, watch out Kathy Lee, to teaching, it was an accident, I swear, to drawing every day, my hand is cramping as I type this, also she has a problem with slipping from third person to first person while writing, I'm so sorry. Also, she usually gets stuff away in her talks, Will the TSA confiscate a t-shirt cannon? What if it's shot confetti? Hmm, how about hot dogs? I love hot dogs. Bring your own ketchup and mustard. I look forward to seeing you all. That was my best. Okay, thank you Let's have another round of applause. And yeah, if you guys have more questions, come on up and. Yeah.